welcome to Crozet United Methodist Church on this Palm Sunday. We do have palm branches in the back if you would like to have one or take one home. Um, in fact, I've got the folding sheet today. We're going to see if the youth at our Bible study are able to make it into a cross. That should be fun. Uh, so we'll give it that a shot a little later. But today is the day where we officially begin Holy Week. And we are on that final leg toward Easter of our Lenten journey. And so as we prepare to enter into this time of worship, which is certainly celebratory, as we remember the reception that Jesus had when he entered into the holy city of Jerusalem, let us take a moment, though, to kind of pause and center ourselves, open ourselves up to God and one another in prayer. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, this is a day where Christians all over the globe Remember and celebrate the arrival of our Lord and Savior, our Messiah, into the holy city of Jerusalem. And it seemed that even for just the briefest of moments that the world recognized who you were. Then they reveled in your presence. They celebrated who you are and your arrival. And before long, Lord, that favor would fade. But for this moment, let us be very present. Let us be very engaged with this memory, this recollection, this celebration, that we may be prepared to move into the deep and profound meaning of the rest of this week, not only in the retelling of the gospel accounts, but in our lives, as we prepare to remember the gift of the sacrament of Holy Communion, the gift of yourself for us upon the cross, and the gift of the empty tomb on that first Easter. We are grateful for who you are and all that you do. And as we move deeper into this time of prayer and praise, we rejoice that you meet us here, just as we are. And you love us through all things, that we might be perfected by that same love. May your will be accomplished for us this day. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. We're going to invite you to stand as you are able as we join together in our opening music. And we're going to start with Here For You. Fire fall down. Let it 
fall. Let it fall. Let it fall. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. Let every heart adore. Let every soul awake. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, welcome in this place almighty god of love be welcome in this place before the day
choose to believe, you and I will see we were meant to be. Yeah. understand that some of our children have a song you want to do. Is that what you'd like to do? Okay, come on up here in the middle. Come on up here. Do you want me to move the donkey so you have room, or are you going to stay right here? Are you good? They are absolutely. Well, come, on. come stand right up here on this big step so that everybody can see how awesome you are. There we go. Okay. All right. That was good. Have a seat down here because we're going to go right into children's time. We're going to go right into children's time. Let me get my donkey back. This is the most obedient donkey I have ever seen. Okay. How are you? All right. So it's Palm Sunday. Who knows what Palm Sunday is? Yes, ma'am. Um, it's when Jesus came to Jerusalem on a donkey. That's right. Everybody put down their coats and palms on the ground. Well, that's right. Yes, ma'am. Well, that's going to come on Friday. That's close. Have a seat, Julian. Come over here and have a seat, girl. I, we're not going to go to this little cross on Friday. On Friday. On Friday, we're going to talk about the cross. That's right. On Friday, we're going to talk about the cross. But this is building up to Easter, right? On Palm Sunday, Jesus entered into the holy city. And when he came into the holy city, he rode on a donkey. Is this the, one, is this the story where they go to Jerusalem and have to do that? Well, no, that was Christmas. But you're right. Gee, they did, well, they didn't go to Jerusalem. They went to Bethlehem, remember? Yeah. Oh, little town of Bethlehem? Yeah. Yeah. Both have a lot to do with what King we, David. What were you worrying about the one where, where baby Jesus comes down from heaven? That's right, when Jesus is incarnate on Christmas. Yeah. Girl. No. Julianne's going to seminary next week. Wow, Julianne. You are a sharp girl. 
All right, so we are, but you're right. It's a whole story of his life, right? God came down and we got baby Jesus. And then Jesus was born in Bethlehem and he grew up like you all are growing up. And then he got to be 30 and he started his ministry and he did ministry for three years. That's why when clergy go to seminary, we take three years to be educated. And then we come back and we do uh, about three years of provisional time before we get ordained. There's a lot of the story of Jesus that we still mirror in our lives. And this is the last week of his earthly ministry. Jesus is still active, Jesus is still doing things, but Jesus is doing things in a different way than how Jesus did before Easter, okay? So that's where we're going. So of course today for your Palm Sunday prayer, I've got green, right? We got green for that. Are you ready to hear this prayer? This prayer is about celebrating because that's what Palm Sunday is. It's a big celebration. Jesus had a parade. They threw down coats. They threw down palm branches. They didn't have streamers back then. But I just wanted to say to you. Yes, ma'am. It's Christmas birthday, too. Whose birthday? It's Christmas birthday. Oh, very good. It's Christmas and my stuffed animals. Yes. You're keeping track of the birthdays of your stuffed animals? Yeah. That's next level, Julian. That is next level. I have trouble remembering my parents' birthdays. It's Oh, well, that's good. Well, then we can celebrate. Are you ready to hear a prayer about celebrating? Yeah. Okay, so here's our prayer. Dear God, I want to celebrate you. You love and forgive me before anyone else. You show me how to be the best I can be. On Palm Sunday, the people celebrated Jesus. They waved palms and sang Hosanna. May I leap for joy and sing to you to show you my love. I am so glad for you, God. This is why I worship and pray. Amen. So there's a big word in there, Hosanna. Do you know what Hosanna means? No. It means praise to the Lord, right? So Hosanna is the word that we say on Palm Sunday. What's that big word that we say on Easter? Oh, no. Hallelujah. All right, Hosanna today. Next week we'll say hallelujah, okay? And hallelujah is like, woo, hooray, biblical hooray. All right, so today, if you want to go running and jumping outside, then you could be shouting Hosanna, and that would be very appropriate for the day, okay? Especially if you have your palm branches, you can do that. All right, so I'm going to have these prayers in the back at the end of the worship service that you can pick them up. And then next week on Easter, not only will I have a bag of surprises for you, but you'll be able to pick up the final prayer. Does everybody, who has like all the prayers? This is week six. Does anybody have all six of them? Yeah? yeah. All right, well, there's spare sheets in the back if you need those. Um, and then we also have them online so that adults can print them for you. But you'll have your little prayer book. And at the end, if you staple it or attach it however you would like to do, you'll have a little rainbow prayer book so that you can keep coming back and offering your prayers all year round. Sound good? Yeah. Okay, you are ready to go, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, I can tell. Be my prayer. Well, we're going to wait on your prayer because you're going to go do children's worship. I promise you'll get a prayer. I promise, okay? Are you all ready for children's worship? I mean, I love the song that you all did. That was pretty awesome. Okay? All right. We will see you back in a little while. I bet they have no idea that they just sang a modern rendition of a very classic hymn. That's awesome. Okay, before we hear our Palm Sunday scripture text this morning, let us once more come together in prayer. Will you pray with me? God, we do remember that your life came to this important moment when you drew closer to the holy city, a place where David had conquered and had built a holy city on a hill. It was meant to be a place to draw God's people together to worship and to adore our Lord. And when you came that first Sunday, you showed them that you were willing to come to them to bring them grace and forgiveness. And that truth wasn't just true for those people at that time and in that place. It is true for all people throughout all time in every place. And today we hear this again. We marvel at your love and your perseverance. And we rejoice that you would be willing to come to us, even when we are sinful, flawed, mortal, 
and fall so short of your glory. Thank you for your forgiveness and your grace and your willingness to come where we are, to meet us where we are, and to transform us wherever we may be in our lives. Thanks be to you, almighty God. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from the gospel account of John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees to, and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they had heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went out to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, you see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Now, I am born and raised in the United Methodist Church, and when I was little, I can remember that we used to get all the kids in the back of the church, and everybody would get their palm branch, and we would walk around and sing this little song about Hosanna, um, and then there's always some snarky adult that would break out into Andrew Lloyd Webber's Hey, Zanna, Hosanna. Um, and here's, here's the thing about it. It was that I think that for a lot of it, it felt like this was for kids. The Palm Sunday was for children, and we loved seeing the kids with the palms, and we loved hearing the kids sing. But let's not be confused. That first Palm Sunday had nothing to do with children, not in the age range of what we think of as children. That first Palm Sunday was about all of God's children, and adults were gathered. Adults were taking off their coats and throwing them on the ground. Adults were breaking off the branches of the palm trees nearby and waving them as a display to acknowledge that Jesus had come. They were doing this because for just the briefest of moments, they seemed to be in alignment, not just with the prophetic truth that God would come in the Messiah, but in alignment with the will of God, the movement in the presence of God, and for perhaps the briefest of time, it was as if the world was following after our Lord. And when we hear these texts and when we sing the songs of Palm Sunday, when we remember that word, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, what we're hearing is the recounting of the scriptures Psalm 118, Zechariah, Zephaniah, those prophetic texts about the arrival of the Messiah in Jerusalem. All of those things were happening. It's one of the most holiest times for the Jews, Passover. This was a time of celebration anyway, because Passover was remembering when God passed over the homes of the Israelites and spared the firstborn in every single one of their homes while they were living in slavery and bondage in Goshen in ancient Egypt. And what we discover is that the entire Passover Seder at that point was celebrating that on their behalf, God had triumphed over their oppressors, over sin and death. And that's what they were celebrating. It was a time of resounding joy and a certain amount of chaos. And the people were so excited, like, here it is. It is happening again because this is our Messiah. And he has come here to this place. Yes, he's come on a donkey, but you know what? Try not to judge what people drive. <laughs> and here he is. He has come and he is going to liberate us. Because in the holy city, there wasn't just the palace of the king, one of Herod's family members at this point, not just the holy temple, the single holiest place in all the world where a piece of God dwelt in the holy of holies, but here is the governor's palace. Rome had taken control of the promised land and they had built a palace for their governor 
to be very close by, to have a garrison of soldiers if these people get out of hand. And when they looked at their holy city, they saw it being profaned. They saw that someone who didn't know their God, who didn't believe in their God and didn't keep their law, was allowed to have not just a presence, but a power. And they longed to see God cleanse the city. They wanted to see God kick out Rome. Get them out of here. And for some of them, there is some past precedent for this. The Assyrians had taken over the northern kingdom of Israel at one point and caused so much chaos. That's where we get the 10 lost tribes moniker from. But they too had fallen to Babylon, which for a while seemed exciting until the southern kingdom of Judah fell to Babylon, and then it wasn't so exciting anymore. And you had the Babylonian exiles, 70 years of suffering and separation from which we get the book of Lamentations in the Old Testament. And so they were used to world powers coming, rising, and falling. They were used to that. They were really good at waiting out other people. They had been around for a long time, the Jews. And they thought, you know, if we wait long enough, you too will fall. But wouldn't it be nice if you fell by our hand? That would be nice. And so they were waiting for their Messiah. He would be a warlord like King David. He would be capable of calling together the military. Maybe God would be so happy with this new Messiah that God would send an angel or two to do the work for us. And then they would have once more their city and their nation. That was the hope. That's what they were celebrating. They saw potential in Jesus that day. Although it's kind of hard with our depictions of Jesus to see him sitting on a donkey and be like, you thought he was going to march right up to Pontius and be like, get out! Well, he did march right up to somewhere and tell them to get out. But it was when he went to the temple on Monday morning and he kicked out all the money changers. And people were like, okay, he's like warming up maybe? Maybe he's getting ready to kick out Rome? You know, like, let's start with this mess and even though it's in our temple and this is slightly awkward. Let's see where he goes. It wouldn't take too long for everything to fade. You know why? Because just like us, the people of Jerusalem and the people who had come from the far reaches of the Roman Empire to be present in the holy city on Passover wanted results now. And when it got to be Monday, Jesus is doing some things. That's cool. When it got to be Tuesday, Jesus is teaching some things. That's nice. But by the time Wednesday and Thursday come, people are like, what is he waiting for? Why is it taking him so long? And that's been our entire theme in Lent is withdrawing and waiting. Learning to be in God's time and not our own. And so I'm sure there were more than one or two of the apostles who were like, okay, we're here. Like, now what? What, what, what are we going to do? We're just going to go to dinner at some guy's house on Wednesday night? What are we, we're we're going to go have the Passover dinner? Like, kind of waiting for fireworks, you know? Like something exciting. But instead, Jesus seems to be doing things that don't make sense. Not if you're thinking like a regular human being. He's not doing anything that makes sense. But what Jesus is doing is teaching and preaching. He is pouring out some of his most important lessons in Holy Week. He is giving all of us unfettered access to God's grace on Holy Thursday. And on Good Friday, he gives every single human being God's gift of grace. And people didn't understand that. They wanted action. They wanted to see that their hopes and dreams, their desire for vengeance or what they considered would be justice and righteousness would be enacted. Certainly he can do this. Absolutely, God can do anything. But why isn't he doing it now? 
And the truth is that even if Jesus had fallen and had caved to the pressure, the positive pressure of the people who lined the streets, who met him at the gates, who were cheering his name and singing the psalm, it wouldn't have solved the problem. Fortunately for us, Jesus does not cave to pressure like we do because Jesus would have been hearing people say, we are so glad you're finally here. Make the changes, kick them out, bring us back to God's heart and God's worship. Do it now, we are here, we are on your side. But you know what? They weren't. They really weren't. Because by Friday, their attitude is kind of, what have you done for me lately? You came in with so much promise, but you didn't meet my timeline. That's why there is such an important precedent in all of the scriptures that we have read throughout Lent about withdrawing and waiting. Because the world is moving at a rapid pace, but that is human pace. And God's time is greater than what we can fathom. God's time is immense. I was talking to one of my friends who's from Liberia, and he was telling me that in Liberia, people will get up at 4 a.m. to get ready to go to worship. Right? Right? I'm going to be up at 4.30 in the morning next Sunday to get ready for 7 a.m. worship. I'm not going to do it again till next Easter. I'm not that super stoked on that, right? Like, we're like, oh, that's, all, that's real hard. It's real hard. But they do because they have to get up. They wear their very best clothing. Many of them will take bus rides or walk or they will carpool, and it will take them up to two hours to get to church. Most of y'all don't want to sit in church for two hours, much less travel two hours to get here. And then they got to get in the mood. They have to sing and to praise, and they use their music, much like the contemporary style, to get themselves excited and energized and ready to worship. And then someone gets up and preaches for more than 45 minutes. <laughs> Y'all get a little antsy when I go for like 30. You're like, is she done? And I was like, you preach for 45 minutes when you go home? And he goes, no, I'm too American now. I preach at like 20. And then they're like, why do you have no energy for God? <laughs> so here's what happens. They do this. They worship for four or five hours. Who knows when they will be done? And then they've got to go home a two-hour journey. And that, my friends, is a regular Sunday. Ordinary time. Think about what you are willing to do in God's time. What is it that you are willing to do? Because God, in the fullness of God's time, came to us in Jesus Christ. Came to us in ways that we didn't expect. I mean, if the same incarnation of Christ that was present in Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday were to walk in here now, he wouldn't speak English, he wouldn't look like this, not that many of you look like this, but he wouldn't look like this, he wouldn't look like almost any of us here. And it would be very strange, but that was the fullness of time for God, that's what God wanted. And then sometimes we get so enmeshed in a culture that's like, now, do it now, hurry up, why isn't this finished, when do you think you'll be done, that we forget that the biggest question isn't when, it's who. Who is asking this of us? Who is asking us to be our best? Who is asking us to show up and be present? Who is it? It is the one who chose to come and be present for you. Chose to come into the holy city knowing that he would not leave alive. Came into the holy city to give some of the most powerful and profound and often quoted and preached upon lessons 
in that Holy Week came to give us I mean, we only have two sacraments in Methodism. We have baptism and Holy Communion. And much of Christianity has the same. There are other denominations that have more sacraments. And I can tell you right now, as bizarre as this is, we agree more on that one than we do this one. And even now, the vast majority of Christians would not draw to the same table and eat the same communion. But that's what Jesus was giving us. And we think about that, right? I will say all day long, one of the greatest things I think that Methodism has figured out is that these two things don't belong to us, they belong to God, and so they're open for everybody. I love open table in the United Methodist Church. I'm looking for that kind of articulation from my colleagues. I want to make sure that I'm hearing that this table is for anybody that wants to come here and what's on it and the grace that it embodies is yours. That's what I want to hear. That's what my soul aches to hear every single time there's communion because it means that God is saying to us, this is yours. I am giving it to you. All you have to do is choose to have it. This grace, the same grace that Jesus poured out. But we can't get to the table until we get to Jerusalem. We can't get the grace until the grace draws close to us on Palm Sunday. And it's learning to celebrate. It's learning to be joyful. It is reminding ourselves, because a lot of us go, well, that's for children. Bad news for us. We're all children in the sight of God. Some of us just act more like it. We're all children. You will never get so old that God will not look at you and go, you are still a kid. You will always be a child in God's eyes. And for some of us, we need to remember that that excitement, that is our testimony. That is our joy. We're supposed to do that. My friend from Liberia was telling me that one of the reasons why the church is so big in Africa and it's growing by leaps and bounds in one quadrinium, the conference of the Congo grew by 400,000. Let me just say that again. 400,000 people decided to become United Methodist Christians in Africa in one conference. That, that makes the book of Acts look like it's slacking. That is amazing. And I said, how can this be? And what he said was, it doesn't matter what role someone has in worship in Africa. They want their neighbors to come and see them. They want their friends, their co-workers, their fellow students, the, the people in their family, their friend circle, they want them to come and see. And they'll say, I'm reading the scripture or I'm leading the music or I'm offering a prayer. Will you come? Will you come and support me and be present and see me as I do this for God? And that's the kind of excitement that they bring. They make every Sunday a Palm Sunday entrance because every Sunday is a little Easter Every Sunday is a resurrection day for us. And that's why, in some ways, Africa has reconnected with that childlike joy that so many of us in Christianity in America have kind of set aside, kind of put aside. I can remember the first time I went to a mega church, and I, it was a huge church in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and I went there for a national worship leader conference. And I went there by myself, because, you know, I'll make friends. And I went there by myself, and I got into the church, and the first thing they did was turn off, like, all the lights. And I'm like, how am I supposed to read the bulletin? Which they didn't have, because, you know, mega church. And I was like, I don't understand what's happening here. This is very weird and foreign to me. And then out came this amazing band, and I was like, I thought we were supposed to be opening with worship. This here is very concert-like to me. And then we kind of did it, and the more that I was there, I was like, oh, this is kind of different. But the one thing I could never understand was, why did it have to be dark? Why did we have to make the sanctuary dark? And here's why I think that we had to make the sanctuary dark. Because people are embarrassed to be that emotional and overjoyed about God. You should never be ashamed of your joy, of your tears, of whatever emotion is evoked in worship. You should never be ashamed of that ever. 
Never. We are all here, and we don't all understand what's happening inside each other, but we do know this, God's happening. And sometimes God makes us cry. Sometimes God makes us cry tears of joy. Sometimes God makes us laugh. Sometimes God makes us really angry. All of those things are okay. They were all embraced in Holy Week. The entire spectrum of human emotions will be passed through in Holy Week. It starts with joy. And guess what it ends with on Easter? Joy! So let's live joyful lives. People were joyful when you were born. And if we have a good theology based upon Easter of resurrection, people will be joyful when you die. Because even though they're sad that you are gone for now, they know they will see you again. I've been at a deathbed uh, this past week. And as I gathered, um, it's, it's really a beautiful thing when the person who is actively dying is able to still talk. And so this person was talking and their spouse was there and one of their adult children was present. And I can remember, you know, just, I mean, an hour goes by like this in God's time. And we were talking and I, I looked at the person who was dying and I said, if you could articulate what you want your legacy to be, what would it be? And they went, oh my gosh, that's a good question. No one's ever asked me that before. What would I want people to remember me as? And this person said, I think it's my nurturing. Not just that I love people or that I'm kind, but that I was a teacher for fourth graders and that I wanted to, these are my words now, equip and empower people to be their best. And I think that that's probably be one of the most Christian ways of articulating a ministry of teaching. It's about equipping and empowering. It's not about making cookie cutter people. It's not about that old banking system where I am the knowledge and I give it to you and then you regurgitate it back to me. What it is is it's about saying to someone, you are precious. You are capable. You can do things. And all we have to do is give you all of the equipment and then stand back and marvel at what you will build. And that is what Jesus was doing on that Palm Sunday. He was equipping and empowering us for joy. Now, before we get to next Sunday's joy, we're going to go through a lot of liturgical emotions. We're going to go through some real painful discussions that Jesus has with his beloved apostles. He's going to be betrayed by Judas. He is going to be completely betrayed by the very same people who are in positions in the religion of power and authority because they were supposed to be leaders and, and to help God's will be enacted for the people. And those same people are going to decide that Jesus has to die. And then they're going to conspire against him with Rome in order to make it happen. And by the time we get to Holy Thursday and Jesus decides as one of his last acts to give us Holy Communion, he's going to break bread with the very same person who will be the direct catalyst of his crucifixion. And then on Holy Friday, Good Friday, we're going to remember all that Jesus went through and all that pain and that suffering. And by far, the lowest attended worship service in the Christian year is Good Friday. Good Friday. And there's something a little apropos about that because that was the day that all of his disciples decided to bug out. That was the day that they were like, you know what, it's getting a little too raw and real and I'm a little afraid, I'm a lot afraid, and I think that we should get away from the crucifixion. And they will. They will abandon him. But Good Friday is not just us showing up to show God that we appreciate all that God suffered and died that we would not have to. It is not just about being a good Christian. This is what Christians do. We go to worship. Good Friday is about us purging all of that doubt and that sorrow, that regret, that pain, that suffering, letting it all go so that we can truly be liberated on Easter. That's what Good Friday is about. 
And so this is the journey that we're on. And then for those of us who go through Good Friday, because you, you can't get to an empty tomb without a cross, by the time that we get to that empty tomb, we are truly rejoicing because we've been on that journey with Jesus. And maybe more than that, we're reminded that Jesus has been on this journey with us. You know that? Your whole life, everywhere you've ever lived, everywhere you've ever gone, everything you've ever experienced, Jesus has been on this journey with you. Jesus has watched you triumph. Jesus has watched you fail. Jesus has watched you skirt by and barely make it through. Jesus has watched you be intentional because of your empowerment, your education, and your equipping. And Jesus has watched you plan and make things happen. And today is about letting our spirits rejoice in all that Jesus has done. And remembering that. Because by Friday, it gets really hard to remember today. Really hard. But on your darkest day, on your darkest day, you have to remember Palm Sunday. You have to remember that the same Jesus that came into Jerusalem has come into your life and in your heart. That same Jesus is with you. That same Jesus is with us. And that's what we celebrate. Now, the next time you need that Palm Sunday moment, you may not have a poem. The next time you need that Palm Sunday moment, I mean, you, you may not be as lucky as I am to have a donkey in your office every day. But remember. Remember the feeling. There's something liberating about taking off your coat and throwing it down and being like, I'm free. I'm free. You know, that's, that's one of the things I've always noticed is that um, nowadays, it's very, it's very rare that I have to go somewhere where all the guys are wearing suits. And a lot of us women, we gave up suits a long time ago. But uh, a lot of guys, you know, but I'll note, I can tell you right now, the minute that it becomes okay to like get casual, the jackets come off, the ties go out the window. It would be so Palm Sunday if the next time that happened, you all just threw them on the floor and we're like, duh! I mean, I understand there's a dry cleaning bill and all kinds of stuff that have to go with that, but it would just be a moment, wouldn't it? You could be like, that was it. These people were taking off the outer layers. They were exposing themselves to God in a way that said, here I am, Lord. And even if it's just for a few hours today, I'm going to celebrate you. So our worship is only an hour, and it's wrapping up. But I really hope that today you won't stop. The sun is shining. We are able to be blessed, and we are able to be a blessing. And I hope that you will find one more instant today to be able to celebrate what today is. Today is your tangible reminder that God, even in the withdrawing and the waiting and the arriving and the being present, in all of those things, God is with you. And there is no cross and no tomb that is going to stop God from being with you. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. In a moment, we're going to worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings and as we prepare to do that, I want to remind you that, you know, it, it's amazing. On days like this, you can see tangible reminders of what we do with our offering. But really, the best reminder about what our offering does today is in the rejoicing and the dancing and the singing of our children. With a curriculum that we purchased and with supplies that you prepare through your gifts, we're able to have another generation that knows a song about giving glory to our God. So yes, your gifts make ministry possible. Let us worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings.
Let us pray. Lord, we thank you. Accept our gratitude and these gifts. For to you, we are your children. You love us in spite of anything that may go wrong. You love us through all things, and you celebrate with us when we rejoice in you and through you. And we pray that now these gifts and these prayers will help others to discover that joy, to begin their Palm Sunday part of their life, where they have joy and know with all that they are that you are their God. May this be the bright and new beginning for forgiven and free people. We ask this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one now and forever. Amen. I have a couple quick announcements to share with you. Uh, the first is that um, we've recently had the opportunity to revamp our children's church approach, and a number of different volunteers have continued to serve while new volunteers have really stepped up in a big way. Come on in, Yurka. Come on in. We're really appreciative of their initiative and their willingness to dive in. And today, as you got to hear our children perform to God be the glory, this is an outgrowth of that retooling and our volunteers' hard work. And we're grateful for all of them and all the work that they've done. Good job, buddy. And we're looking for some volunteers for Easter breakfast. So between sunrise at 7 a.m. and our 9 a.m. contemporary Easter worship service, we've got an Easter breakfast. It is free to the community. If you would like to provide something for that breakfast, then you can sign up online or on the church blog, or you can reach out to us at the church office. And when it comes to Easter and Sunday, there isn't a whole lot more fun than an Easter egg hunt on the church lawn. So between our 9 a.m. and our 11 a.m. worship services, we're going to have an Easter egg hunt and an Easter egg roll using those big spoons to roll the eggs in the fun race format for children up to fifth grade with a special section of the church grounds roped off for four and under so that they don't have to compete with the older kids. Come on out, bring a basket. We'll have some awesome Easter egg related fun between our worship services. And then we're going to ask you to save the date. On April 14th, we're going to hold a Vacation Bible School Volunteer Interest Meeting that will uh, start after the conclusion of the 11 o'clock worship service, so around 12, 15 p.m. Come on out, find out about all the various roles that you could fill. You can ask questions. You can get introduced to this year's VBS theme, Stellar, which is about outer space, as you can see here. It's going to run from July 29th to August 2nd. It's an incredibly important outreach event for almost 100 children that doesn't happen without a veritable army of volunteers. So please come on out and consider volunteering, even if it's just for a day or to help prepare. And then we have our last call for our Easter flower dedications. Dedicating Easter flowers that adorn our altar and the chancel in the sanctuary is a long-standing tradition at Crozet, and we're happy to continue it this Easter season. You've got three ways that you can give that $15 for a dedication. The deadline for your dedication being recognized in the slides on Easter Sunday is today. It's got to be done today so that we can start processing those slides this week. In addition to all the other worship services, our, our team has got to put together all those slides, so we really got to put a deadline on that. Now, you can continue to make dedications throughout the week, but they're just not going to be in the slides for Easter. You can fill out the Google form that was linked in our e-news. It's on the church website, or you can call the church office during the week, and we'll take your dedication over the phone. And then you're welcome to take home the flowers after the 11 a.m. worship service on Easter. And then we hope that you will come and worship with us during Holy Week. We're moving into this final part of Lent, and we hope that you will mark your calendars. We've got Holy Thursday. This will be the focus on communion this year. On the 28th at 7 o'clock, we'll have that service here in our sanctuary. Same thing on Good Friday, 7 p.m. And we have 10 youth that are going to be readers in a tenebrae portion of that. So we hope that you will join us for that opportunity. And then Easter is March 31st, sunrise at 7 a.m. Actual sunrise is projected for 7.01, so we will not dwell in darkness for long. Easter breakfast at 8 a.m., contemporary Easter service at 9 and traditional Easter worship at 11. And then our Salt Middle School group is not meeting tonight. Uh, one of our key volunteers will be out of town this afternoon. Um, but the seed will meet tomorrow night. So the seed for third, fourth, and fifth graders, we're going to do some Holy Week fun activities, a little bit of music and games, and they'll have a chance to kind of kick off their Holy Week in that way too. So that'll be at 5.30 in the Fellowship Hall on Monday. That is not correct. Oh, wait, no, it is. Yes, it is. Okay, yes. See tomorrow, salt, no. Okay, there we go. Now we're there. All right. Uh, we are grateful for all uh, of you and all that you are and all that you do and all that God does in you and through you. And so we're going to invite you to stand as you are able. Let us sing our closing song, what is more appropriate, Hosanna.
So just to let you know, this is a new song in honor of Palm Sunday called Hosanna. We think you'll enjoy singing the chorus along with us, and I hope you enjoy Hosanna. Of the Lord, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. King of Israel, welcome to our hearts. Here to reign in righteousness, O ruler of the world, ruler of our hearts. Now ascend your throne. You are the King of Kings, oh, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. To Jerusalem, to the sons of men, riding on in gentle strength. Of to save your own, come to give your life, the kingdom is at hand. You are the King of kings, oh, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. King of Israel, welcome to our hearts, here to reign in righteousness, O ruler of the world, ruler of our hearts, now ascend your throne. You are the King of kings, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna, 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 Hosanna. Thank you for being with us to celebrate all that God not only did, but is doing. And so will you receive this blessing inspired by our week six prayer? God is offering you the opportunity to experience love and forgiveness that comes like no one else and to show you how to be the very best that you can be, to fulfill the promise of your creation. On that first Palm Sunday, people celebrated Jesus with their poems and their song of Hosanna. May you leap for joy and sing to God and show your love, not just for God, but for all God's people. May this be the fuel for your worship and your prayer this day. Go forth in peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one now and forever. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Oh. Blessed is the 